On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame How I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I So despised by the world As a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left His glory above To bear it to dark hell folks and welcome to Port Rush Baptist to our Bible study this evening and again kitchen table and we're looking forward as we say so often looking forward to the day when we can all be back to the church building again but with social distancing and all the rest of it we have to do this at the kitchen table but we're glad to do it and we're so thankful for YouTube and and how it allows us to to bring God's word to so many people and thank you so much for joining in with us uh, this evening, we really do appreciate that. Could I just remind you of our morning moments this week at 10 o'clock? And this is the last week, the finishing. But then every Friday after that at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a word for the weekend. But uh, you tune in this week for the morning moments. And then Sunday, our morning service at 11 o'clock. And then the gospel again at 6.30. So I think that's all the announcements I have to make. It's great. So few announcements to make in these days. But... Before we get into God's word and, and before we start to study, we, we just want to bow in a word of prayer. So let's, let's pray together. Father, we come into thy presence this evening in the Savior's name. And Father, as we read about these disciples and 
as we read of their, their great triumphs and their great victories of faith, we also learn of their mistakes. We see their failures. And Father, we comfort our own selves in the knowledge that they were men of, of like stature as ourselves. And Father, we thank thee and we praise thee that you took these ordinary men and they used them, you used them for your glory. And Father, it reassures us that you can take us weak and frail and, and apt to stray as we are. And yet by your grace, your mercy, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can take us and use us for your glory. So Father, tonight as we turn to your word, we pray our Father that thou would bless us from it, that we might be taught, that we might know what it is just to live with a closer walk with thee and even to learn from the mistakes that Peter made, that we might live a life, our Father, that would tell for thee in these days. So Father, bless our study. And just guide us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we're looking at the carpenter's tools, folks. We're looking at the 12 disciples. And we started last week by looking at Peter, the leading disciple. And I thought I'd be able to finish it this week, but we're going to have another week as well, because there's just too much to study uh, out of this man just to finish it in the two weeks that I thought I could. But you stick with me and, and listen, I, I trust that we'll all enjoy this study. But tonight, again, we're looking at Peter, the leading disciple, and I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Now keep your Bibles open because we're turning to different passages about Peter throughout the scripture here. So you, you try and keep with me as best you can. But we're in Luke chapter 22. That's where we're going to start. And we're going to read verses 31 and 32. So that's Luke 22. And verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thou, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Amen. And we know that God will bless the public reading of his own inspired, precious, holy, infallible word. The, the great theologian, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this about the disciples. They wandered on earth and lived in heaven. And although they were weak, they protected the world. They tasted of peace in the midst of turmoil. They are poor, and yet they have all they want. They stand in suffering and remain in joy. They appear dead to all outside sense and lead a life of faith within. Wonderful words, isn't it? And apt to describe these 12 men that we're thinking about. This is not just to be the description of the 12 alone. You see, I believe this should be the description of all who would seek to follow the Lord. As we look around the church today and as we look at ourselves, we cannot help but see there are very few today who want to follow the Lord. Um, we all seek to have our own way. And we camouflage it with the, the paint of commitment. We sing songs of surrender. And then we just, we just go and do whatever we want to do. We indulge our conscience in service. But then we, we jump ship when real commitment is needed. We say God's will be done. As long as it doesn't clash with my lifestyle. And we have to ask the question, as we look at the world today and we look at the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ in the world today, we have to ask this very searching and pointed question. Where are the true disciples of Christ to be found today? Where are the believers whose hearts God has touched? Believers who, like Peter, have had a life-changing meeting with the Lord, who enter into moments with the Lord that mold and shape their lives, following Jesus cost these men their lives. And I wonder, are we willing to lay down our lives for the cross of Calvary? Where are those today, beloved, who will step into the fiery furnace of discipleship, declaring that whether they live or whether they die, they're the Lord's? Where are the disciples who who don't want to serve for popularity, who, who don't seek the acclaim of people, who, who are not looking for a name for pe people to immortalize, 
but they serve because they're crucified with Christ. You see, today we want discipleship without cost. We want service that doesn't interrupt our lives. We want a witness that the world approves of. Well, can I be very pointed to you this evening? Can I be very straight with you to this evening? God finds such sickly endeavor, endeavors stomach churning. And if these studies mean anything to us, then they must make a change in our lives. And you may find my opening comments this evening offensive to you. But I want to tell you, they are born out of my own frustration with my own life and my own service for the Lord. And I've been saved 45 years. I'm nearly 30 years in the ministry. And so often I feel like a failure. Does it mean, does it mean that we're to be perfect? That there's no room for mistakes? No, no. Service to the Lord. It doesn't mean that we'll be perfect. Being a disciple doesn't mean that you're perfect. That would be impossible. For as we will see this evening, Peter, in spite of his meeting with the Lord and his moments with the Lord, he was a man who made mistakes in the Lord. And this evening, I just want to highlight four of those mistakes to see what lessons you and I can learn from them. That if we have already made them, we can recover from them. But also to make sure that we don't make those mistakes. Prevention is better than cure, I think, sometimes. So firstly, I want you to see that Peter sought, the first mistake Peter made was he sought to divert God's plan. He sought to divert God's plan. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 verses 21 to 23. And it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, that this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Let me just read to you verses 13 down through to verse 20 very quickly. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, thou shalt be bound in heaven. And what thou sh shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. What a great statement of faith and what a great statement of fact comes from Peter when he says thou art the Christ the son of the living God and the Lord bestows upon Peter a wonderful commendation that he would be the first of the foundation stones of the New Testament church he would be a, a foundation member and that he would lead the way in the proclamation of the gospel to the Jewish people and that he would hold the keys of the kingdom of heaven uh, this verse has inflamed much debate throughout the years and is indeed a verse that is used by the Roman Catholic Church who would hold to the, the, the relation to Peter being the first pope and the apostolic cessation given to every pope since that. And so they have this apostolic succession that's given to every pope and they say that comes from Peter. He holds the keys. Let me just deal with that. It's evident that Peter was the first to make this statement of faith. No doubt about that. But in chapter 18, 
And, and in verse 18, um, the Lord says to all the disciples, <laughs> you see, you have, to, you have to get this. He says to all the disciples, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And it's very clear that the keys of the kingdom were given to all the apostles. And there's absolutely no mention of them being handed down to anybody else. So listen, the idea of the Pope doesn't float. These verses for me are an affirmation of the authority and power of the apostles that would begin at Pentecost and continue right through the millennial reign of Christ. Listen uh, to what the Lord said in, in Matthew 19 and verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Peter is only the first of the 12. He's nothing more and he's nothing less than that. Now in regards to Peter and the whole rock debate that we have here, where the Lord says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are two words that are used here for rock that the Lord uses. One is Petros and it means a stone or a small rock. And the second is the Greek for Petra, which means a great rock. So while Peter will be seen by many as the leader by the statement of faith, a rock in the New Testament church, but he's not the foundation rock. <laughs> the grounding and granite rock upon which the church will stand is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the far greater rock. And so, you know, you have to sort these things out. And get them sorted out in their mind. And that's where there's an awful lot of air has crept in. But that's by the way. But just a moment, just a few moments after making this great statement of faith, Peter is seeking to divert the plan of God. Listen to verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus I began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. And the Lord begins to unfold to his disciples the whole plan of redemption about his death and his resurrection. But look at Peter in verse 22. And it says, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, that this shall not be done unto thee. Beloved, right on the heels of the great victory of that statement of faith comes defeat. From the heights of praise, <laughs> David, or, or, or Peter just seems to plunge into the depths of disgrace. Peter learned <laughs> from this mistake that, that the devil can fill your mouth just as the same as the Lord can fill it. And in a moment, he went from the center of God's will to the center of the devil's will. And he receives the strongest rebuke the Lord would give to any of his disciples. Beloved, can I say to you this evening, dear child of God, beware of what comes on the heels of a victory. Don't get big headed. Now let me show you the door by which the devil got in. Listen to the Lord's rebuke. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. Now look at what happens when we allow the things of the world to mean more to us than the things of God. First of all, Peter doubted the Lord. Verse 21. Uh, the Lord tells of the great plan of salvation that was going to be enacted. And he doubts the plan and the sovereignty and the power and the, the, the authority of the Lord. And he says, this shall not be unto thee. Christ has told them, I'm going to suffer many things at the hand of the religious leaders of the day. They're going to tell lies about me and they're going to crucify me. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. I'm dying for the sin of the world. And he tries to doubt, to doubt the Lord. And secondly, he, he dilutes his reverence for the Lord. Verse 22, it says, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. That word took in the Greek, it means to take by the hand and lead. And so we can picture the scene. Peter lays hold upon the Lord by the arm and he leads him away out of the road. 
And the word rebuke, it means to speak sharply. And, the, and Peter loses all sense of reverence and awe of God. He had declared that the Lord was the son of God. And now he grabs him by the arm to chastise him. And he lost the reverence for the Lord. I want to tell you, we're in danger today in our church fellowships of losing reverence for the Lord. We have so many things that we want to bring into church today to please ourselves, to cater for our own entertainment. And they don't reverence the Lord. They don't. When we set our eyes upon the things of the world and we try to bring them into the church and weave them into our services and our work for the Lord, listen, we start to doubt the Lord and we dilute our reverence for the Lord. And thirdly, he declined the will of the Lord. Verse 22, Peter took him, began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You see, this went against everything that Peter had been taught to believe as a Jew. You see, the Jews were looking for a military and political leader, someone who would make them a great nation again, someone who would deliver them from under the heel of the Roman Empire. He, the, the Jewish nation was not looking for a servant. They were not looking for a lamb. They were not looking for a sacrifice. And beloved, this is the very same temptations that the devil tempted the Lord with in the wilderness. You see, the devil said to the Lord, turn the stones into bread. Gain man's loyalty, loyalty by offering them material blessings. Then he says, jump from the, the temple pinnacle. Dazzle them with the sensational. Then he says, fall down and worship me. Compromise with the world's ways. And take the way of power and glory. But don't take the way of the cross. And in that moment, Peter confronts the Lord with the same temptations. And what you know what he's saying? Here's what he's saying. To the Lord. He said, Lord, you need to be a man of the people and not the son of God. That's what he said. You need to be a man of the people and not the son of God. And so the Lord says, get behind me. You are an offense and a hindrance to me. There are so many today in our church who are doubting the word of God. They're seeking to change what God has set said to fit their own agenda. They are diluting reverence and they're declining to surrender to the word of God. Beloved, when we doubt the Lord, when we dare to enter his presence without reverence and awe, when we decline his will for our will, we are no longer following the Lord. We're following the devil. What a mistake to make for the people of God to follow the devil's plans. Oh, he, he diverted the Lord's plans. But secondly, Peter made a mistake when he failed to learn the lesson. Made a mistake when he failed to learn the lesson. Let me take you to John now. Let's go to John. John chapter 13. John chapter 13 and, and verses 1 to 20. It's quite a wee reading here, but just stick with me. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which are in the world, he loved them unto the end. The supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he raised, he raised from supper <clears throat> and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then came, cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master 
And Lord, uh, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. I tell you before it come <clears throat> that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth, whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. This is a portion of scripture that's often forgotten about. It's often skipped over. I very rarely heard anyone preach uh, on this portion of scripture. But there are lessons to be learned here that Peter failed to see. The Lord and his disciples are in the upper room. It's the night before Calvary. And the Lord has instituted the Lord's Supper in the place of the Passover. For what was the shadow in the Old Testament, what the Passover spoke of in the Old Testament, was now substance in the Lord Jesus Christ. And after the supper, he rose from the table. And the Lord takes the basin of water and a towel and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Something that they should have done before ever they sat down to meet. And when the Lord comes to Peter, Peter, no doubt, and, and we can give a, a measure of commendation to him here. But Peter, no doubt, out of love and devotion for the Lord, he says, Dost thou wash my feet? And the Lord says, What I do know, knowest not thou, but thou shalt know hereafter. And what the Lord was saying to Peter was this, Peter, there are lessons here that you need to learn. But Peter protests. That their Lord should ever stoop to wash their feet. He says, thou shalt never wash my feet. And now comes the first lesson for Peter. Because the Lord says, Peter, if you will not submit to my way, you can't follow me. You can't be part of my plan. You can't be part of my walk, verse 8. Beloved, without submission, there can be no service. Without submission to the will of God and the plan of God, there can be no part for you and me in God's work. Second lesson, salvation saves the soul, but not the walk. Do you see that in verse 9? Peter said unto him in verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You can't help but love Peter. You can't help but love him. It's, it's for, he, he's, he's the type of man that's all or nothing. That's the type of man he is. And he says, if this is what it takes to follow you, Lord, then wash all of me. But look at what the Lord says in verse 10. He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. The literal meaning here is this. He who has bathed need not to wash except his feet. Beloved, because we are saved, and we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we need not concern ourselves with our souls and where our eternal soul is destined to be. We, we needn't worry about that. The soul doesn't need to be cleansed again, but our work does, our lives does. And salvation is not a license to do what you want. Salvation is a light unto the way that we're to live. And every day, beloved, we need to check our feet. <laughs> you need to check your feet to see if you need to wash them. Because they can get contaminated by the world. And our walk can be ruined by sin. But the third lesson. The walk tells the truth. The Lord says there at the end of verse 11. Ye are not all clean. You see beloved wolves. Don't walk the same way that sheep walk. And, and devils don't walk the same as the saints walk. And the walk will tell you what's in the heart. And in this washing of the feet, the Lord was showing his disciples and Peter how to see through the fog of lies and see those who are truly of the Lord. You see, beloved, the scripture tells us that not everyone on that day when, when they stand before God and give an account, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is saved. But the Lord says, by their fruit, you shall know them, by their walk. And the last lesson, service speaks of happiness. Verses 12 down through to verse 20. The Lord, if you do these things, 
happy are ye. It says there in verse 17, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. True Jewish tradition said that a teacher couldn't be expected to, his, couldn't expect his, his uh, students to wash his feet. He couldn't do that. So how amazing it was for the Lord to wash his disciples' feet. And he says, this is an example of love one for another. Just don't do it in word. Do it in deed. Go the extra mile. Do the unexpected service. Don't think that anything is beneath you. Because when you follow my example, the Lord says you're going to find true happiness in service. Follow the Lord's example. And always be ready to step in and to serve the Lord Oh, beloved, Peter failed to learn the lesson. So caught up with how he saw things to be done. Beloved, if we can learn these lessons, I think we'll be happy. <laughs> I think we'll be happy in the service of the Lord. Submit to God's way. Salvation saves the soul, but not the walk. Check your feet. And the walk tells the truth. And service brings happiness. Peter sought to divert God's plan. He failed to understand the lessons. But thirdly, Peter fought the wrong fight. If you go with me again to John chapter 18 and verses 10 and 11, Peter fought the wrong fight. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. Now they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll get to that. But it says here, when Simon Peter, uh, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the seat sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Peter fought the wrong fight. Let me deal with this very, very quickly. You see, beloved, the real battle was to be fought on the hill called Mount Calvary. That's where the real battle was going to be fought. But Peter, armed with a sword, swings into action to defend the Lord by cutting off Malchus' ear. In verse 10. And the Lord says, Peter, you're fighting the wrong fight. Now there are three things that contributed to Peter's fighting the wrong fight. And I believe they stand today as a stark warning for you and me. Because I think there are believers today and they're fighting the wrong fight. You see, Peter was sleeping first of all when he should have been praying. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. If you go to, to the book of Mark. Uh, and you will have time to read Mark chapter 14, verses 37 to 42. And you can read these. But they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. They've left the, 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 the Passover meal where the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper. And, and Judas Iscariot is left to go and be about his dark business. And the Lord leads the rest of the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we have the place of one of the most amazing prayers that were ever, was ever here. As the Lord agonizes over what would soon come to pass. And he takes Peter, James, and John a wee bit further from the rest of the disciples so that they could witness firsthand what it meant for their Lord, the Holy One, to bear away their sin. But we know what happens, don't we? They fell asleep. The Lord had said to them in verse 38, Watch ye and pray. Lest ye enter into temptation, the spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. And what happens? They doze off. How many believers today are sleeping when they should be praying? More concerned with the temporal, more concerned with the immediate than they are with the eternal. More concerned with their own comfort and their own well-being than with the souls of men and women. I tell you, if you and I are not prepared to pray, we're fighting our own fight. We'll end up fighting the wrong fight. It's interesting that while the three were sleeping, only Peter was rebuked. Did you notice that? Well, here's why I think this. Here's a wee note to the leaders. You see, you and me who are in leadership, we are held responsible for the actions of those we lead. And the Lord expected far better from Peter. He did. And I want to tell you, the Lord expects more from me than he does from you. Because he's placed me in a place of leadership. And I need to be praying and not sleeping. Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. 
But secondly, Peter was seething when he should have been seeing. John chapter 18, verses uh, uh, 4 and 5, 4 and 6. John chapter 18, 4, and 4 to 6. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And the answer, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Peter had witnessed the power of the great I am. All the soldiers fell back to the ground. And that, that would have been the band of soldiers that came that night would have been between 300 and 600 soldiers. And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And the Lord said, I am. And they all went backwards and fell to the ground. I want to tell you, listen, let me just interject a wee thought here. We're looking at the world today that is so hostile against the things of God and the people of God today. Listen, we need to lift up the great I am. And the great I am drives back every force of darkness. Every force of darkness. But Peter was so caught up with what he thought he should do. That he missed this demonstration of omnipotence. And it led him into the wrong battle. Beloved, how many of us are so caught up with what we think should, we should be doing. And what others should be doing. Or caught up with what we should be allowed to do. That we don't see what the Lord's doing. How many of us. Think that we that we can't be done without. And that we are the ones, we are the only ones who get things done. And for us, it's all about might and power and not about the Spirit of God. And many of us are angry because we see the Lord mistreated today. And we want to protest. We want to get out onto the streets. We want to make a show of our strength. We want to, as it were, you know, fight back. Something should be done. And we miss the reason for what is happening. And we fail to understand that the Lord is omnipotent. And the Lord has never lost control of the events that's going on in the world. Way back there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And where we are today. The Lord's still omnipotent. He's still in control. And sometimes we end up fighting battles we should never be fighting. When all the wild souls are perishing. I want to tell you Christian. I want to lay it out brave and clear to you this evening now. The job you and me need to be involved in today is winning souls. That's the job we need to be. That's the fight we need to be fighting. We need to be fighting for the salvation of precious souls. That's what's important. Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. He was seething when he should have been seeing. But Peter was swinging when he should have been believing. And he swings the sword when he should have been believing what the Lord had taught them. That all these things had to come to pass. And what did the Lord say in Matthew 26 and 53? Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father? And he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. The Lord didn't need Peter's sword. Had a bit of it. But he demanded Peter's faith. Because he is the son of God. And so often... We hear a call to get onto the streets and make our case and flex our muscles when we should be calling to prayer and belief in God. But of these, there, there is a day coming. There is a day coming, beloved, when the Lord will come with 10,000 of his angels. And he is the judge of all the earth and he'll do right. And he'll right all the wrongs. He'll put everything into place. He will deal with the morality of our nation. He will deal with the morality of the world. He will deal with sin and sinners. You see, beloved, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I want to tell you something. These enemies will not be defeated by you and me marching on the streets. They won't be. They'll be defeated by you and me on our knees. And obeying the word of God. These enemies can only be overcome by fasting and prayer and by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Peter followed the devil's plan. He failed to understand the lesson. He fought the wrong battle. But finally, Peter faltered at the world's fire. Let me take you back to Matthew again. Matthew chapter 26. 
Matthew chapter 26 and, and verse 69 there down to verse 75. Now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. Now the Lord has been arrested. He's been judged now. But he denied before them all saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that were there. This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, surely thou also art one of them for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, which said unto him, Before the cock crew, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter faltered at the world's fire. He had boasted beforehand, My, that the Lord would not go to this alone, that he would die with him. That he would stand with them all the way. And the Lord says, Peter, before the cock crows tonight, you'll have denied me three times. Why, when we think of this and Peter's mistake, this is the one that stands out, isn't it? But before we would be too hard on Peter, let me say something that we so often forget. He was the only one of the 12 who put himself in the place to fail. The rest ran away. And so there's a measure of commendation, uh, commendation to be given to Peter here. Again, you have to admire him a bit. You see, so many of God's people never get into the position to fail. But they're quick to tear down others who do. But having said that, Peter does make a grievous mistake here. From which Peter himself believed and felt that there could be no forgiveness. There could be no way back. He had denied the Lord. With, with oaths and, and cursing. How could he ever be restored? How could, how could God ever want him now? And you can look at this in more depth and put more meat on these points I'm going to give you now. I, I just don't have time tonight. But firstly, I want you to see that Peter stopped in the wrong place. Verse 69. says there in verse 69, My Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. He went so far with the Lord, and then he stopped. He would go so far in being identified with Christ, but he stopped short of going through with the Lord. And beloved, this is the first step in denying the Lord. To be faithful, you have to go through with God. What did the Lord teach them in Matthew 10 and 38? And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Do you think, beloved, that the Lord's just spinning us a yarn when he's telling us that? I tell you, if you want to be anything for the Lord, if I want to be anything for the Lord, we need to go through with the Lord. But something else, Peter stood at the wrong fire. Uh, John 18 and 18 puts it like this. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Peter swapped the fire in his heart for the fire in the hearth. And he stood with everyone else that was standing. Beloved, can I say something to you? There, there is, a, there is a, a train of thought today and there's a school of teaching today that, that seems to be putting out that if we want to reach the world, we have to be like the world. We have to imitate the world. We, we have, to, we have to, to acclimatize ourselves to the world. We, the world has to identify with us and we have to identify with the world. And here's Peter, and he's standing where everybody else was standing. Can I tell you something, beloved? You'll never speak for the Lord and stand at the world's fire. Never. And as Peter stands looking into the flames of that fire, he's overcome by the fear of man. You see, he's listening to their talk. And he's listening to their hatred of the Lord. And he can't say a word. And even before a word of challenge is issued to him, he's lulled by the comfort of just being the same as everybody else. <laughs> How many of us, as God's people, 
just want to be the same as everybody else. I just want to be able to do what, what folk that are not saved can do. Beloved, the church of Jesus Christ is in danger in these last days of losing the fire of Holy Ghost anointing because we want to cozy up to the world and be like them. That's never the case. We are never to be like the world. We are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And at that moment, when, when Peter moves away from the fire of the Holy Ghost and favors the, 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 the burning embers of this world, he loses his testimony. And I want to tell you, beloved, if we cozy up to the world's fire, we're going to lose our testimony. We have denied the Lord. And thirdly, I want you to see something else. Peter swore allegiance to the wrong flag. It says there in verse 74, Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crowed. And it says in verse 75, he went out and wept bitterly. Luke puts it like this in Luke 22 and verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Beloved, if we fail to go through with the Lord, if we like Peter stand at the wrong fire, I want to tell you very soon we will swear our allegiance to the wrong flag. We will we'll be like the world. And the result will be tears and ruin. Oh, the mistakes that Peter made. And yet, was that the end of the man? Surely nobody could recover from all of those mistakes. Oh, surely that had to be the end of The Lord would just cast him aside. Who could use anybody like that? Oh, no. No, no. That wasn't the end of this man. For this same man would in years to come pen these words under the inspiration of the fire of the Holy Ghost. He would say, "Be sanct but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What a change! What happened? What changed this man who was so riddled with mistakes that he could come in years to come and, and write these words. You're going to have to tune in next week just to find out what happens to this man. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts and to our souls this evening. Let's just bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank thee for your word. We thank thee, Father, for its sharpness tonight. We thank thee for its directness. And we pray, our Father, that, that we will have learned from it. And Father, if we have failed, we would know how to recover. Father, we just thank thee for this great work of the gospel you have placed into our hands. Father, this great privilege of, uh, Father, preaching the word of God. And Father, ministering the gospel to everyone. And Father, we do thank thee that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And Father, we pray that we would always be found in the place of prayer. That we would be found, our Father, with our hearts and souls on fire with Holy Ghost anointing. That we would never, never be standing with our arms and our hands warming at the world's fire. But Father, we would be a witness and testimony of thy grace and of thy mercy to all that we would meet. So Father, take us, mold us and shape us to what you would have us be. For we ask it in Jesus' precious and lovely name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, folks. Thank you so much for joining with me this evening in our Bible study. And God willing, we'll meet again. God bless. i
save your life.